Since November, San Diego has been dealing with the biggest outbreak of hepatitis A in years. The disease, which is an infection of the liver, has sickened 444 people and killed 16, according to the latest information from the county health department. There's a reason why you probably haven't heard much about this disease unless you've been traveling abroad recently. It's spread through what they call the fecal oral route, and proper sanitation is usually enough to keep the disease at bay. Still, San Diego's growing homeless population is particularly vulnerable to the virus because of one simple fact. Homeless people don't have adequate access to bathrooms. The county has declared a medical emergency. Bathrooms and hand-washing stations have been installed downtown, and free vaccinations are being offered to the homeless and people in contact with them. This outbreak has garnered national attention, and now America's finest city's reputation is on the line because of this outbreak. Let's take a step back and find out why this crisis has been a long time coming. I'm Daniel Wheaton, and this is Refocus. The virulent spread of hepatitis A has leaders in the homeless community looking for answers and spreading information at the same time. And now the disease is hitting them at home. Three people were dead before San Diego County public health officials organized street teams to vaccinate people against hepatitis A. It was early May, and 80 cases had been confirmed since November, and 66 were hospitalized. Epidemiologists identified a rash of the disease two months earlier. Still, it took until September until the county declared a health emergency after the bodies totaled 14. To get an understanding of this ongoing health crisis, we have healthcare reporter Paul Sisson. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you. So uh, you've been covering this since the city first announced that this was an ongoing crisis. Back in the beginning, was there fear that this would get this big? I don't think anybody saw this coming. I think that uh, generally they thought they would be able to contain it with some basic outreach to the homeless population where they really saw it start. I think they you know, did some initial vaccination campaigns at our local homeless shelters and other organizations that serve the homeless, and I think they thought that that kind of work uh, would, would get the job done. I, I think everybody's pretty surprised that this thing has become the largest hepatitis A outbreak since they released the vaccine back in 1999. Yeah, it really is telling. And when you look at the numbers, it is quite large. Uh, 444 is the current number of cases and that is likely to increase. Additionally, you did a Q&A um, last week explaining the basis of hepatitis. Why don't you explain to our listeners what this disease is and what are the basic things people can do to not get infected? Sure. I guess I should start by explaining that I am not a doctor or an epidemiologist. Uh, so the knowledge that I have, I've gained just by talking to experts, you know, both here in town and uh, at the CDC and the California Department of Public Health. Uh, you know, this is a viral uh, disease that generally uh, transfers from person to person uh, in, uh, in what they call the fecal to oral route. That's a little gross, but... Uh, uh, we all have to bear with uh, things that are gross sometimes when we're talking about public health issues. That means that, uh, you know, if you go to the bathroom and you don't wash your hands afterwards or if you don't wash your hands well enough uh, and then you touch something that another person is going to put in their mouth, like food, drink, uh, if you're smoking, uh, you know, also other forms of contact uh, like having sex, uh, you know, that can spread this disease from one person to another uh, you know, so it's not like the flu. It's not airborne. If you cough or sneeze and you have hepatitis A, somebody's not going to pick it up by breathing in that air that you exhaled. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it, it, it transmits pretty much on people's hands. Mm -hmm. So doorknobs, utensils, anything that you can touch and kind of forget about could be a source of getting it. That's right. You know, in talking to some of the experts, you know, there's a lot of concern about doorknobs and railings and handles and things like that. Uh, I've been told that the biggest concern there really is things that are moist, like foods, like cold foods, uh, more so than, than doorknobs and handles and toilet seats and that kind of thing. I guess this thing likes a moist environment more mm -hmm. than a, a dry environment that's like out in the sun or something. Uh, you know, I'm actually working on getting some better interviews right now on kind of what what that means in certain contexts, like, say, the, the public trolleys. You know, if you're riding the trolley and you grab a handrail when you get in, uh, you know, and someone who had hepatitis A was there 
two minutes before, you know, what does that mean? Uh, you know, are, are, is, it, is it possible you could get it from that contact? Probably. Is it likely? You know, what's the probability of that? That's something that I'm actually exploring right now uh, today, trying to get a little more information from some experts outside of town on that. Okay. And um, for someone who has, contra who has become sick with hepatitis A, what happens when you run through some of the symptoms? Yeah, you know, uh, it's really interesting uh, just to understand first and foremost that the uh, incubation period for this uh, viral infection is so long, it can be anywhere from 5 to 50 days. Uh, you know, and the incubation period is the time from when you're infected to when you show your first symptoms. Uh, the, you know, the, the kind of signature uh, symptom that uh, everybody is talking about is jaundice. That's the, uh, the yellowing of your skin or uh, yellowing of the whites of your eyes. And that's often uh, the, the symptom that sends people to a uh, healthcare provider, either a hospital or, uh, or their regular doctor. Uh, you know, you've got fever, diarrhea, uh, you know, tiredness, other, uh, other symptoms as well in that mix. Uh, in some cases, uh, there are no symptoms. And I guess in kids, uh, it's uh, quite often the case that there are no symptoms. Symptoms are more common in adults. It takes root in your liver and reproduces in your liver, uh, and so that, uh, you know, that's, that's a really important point. Um, you know, we've had 16 deaths, and that's got a lot of media attention. Uh, it's important to note that everybody who has died has had other uh, health complications, like, a, like an existing hepatitis C infection or, uh, you know, a certain liver disease. Uh, cirrhosis of the liver is one that's very... Uh, uh, difficult, you know, this thing is, uh, you know, if you already have a compromised uh, liver and, and you get attacked by hepatitis A, your chances of serious complications are much, much higher, and they say you should definitely run out right now and, and make sure you get vaccinated. You're in the highest risk group that's, uh, that's out there. Mm -hmm. And also earlier this week, you did a story with business reporter Lori Weisberg about how the cookie con decided to not come to San Diego <laughs> because yeah. of the ongoing hepatitis A outbreak. Um, what are your thoughts on that action? Why don't you tell us a little bit of what it was like to report that story? Yeah, you know, it was a little tough. I mean, uh, nobody wants to hear that, uh, that this, uh, this outbreak could be affecting uh, one of our most important local industries. You know, we're a huge uh, convention city here in San Diego, uh, you know, thousands, you know, we're, we're the home of Comic-Con, for example, you know, so, uh, so I think everybody was a little reluctant to talk about that idea, and, and there was a lot of suspicion that this, uh, that this conference that was coming out of L.A. was actually having trouble uh, meeting the uh, number of people that it needed to actually host the event at the convention center, and this might be a convenient way to get out of that. I don't know if that's uh, true or false. I have no idea. Uh, but, but definitely, uh, you know, the idea that this would spill over from something that was in largely our homeless population uh, to, uh, to our, our tourism industry, our convention industry, was something that, uh, that everybody was, you know, leery to talk about. But yet I think uh, it's, it's important to show that this is not just a homeless problem that, uh, you know, if you don't take care of this kind of stuff, if you don't take it seriously, if you don't really knuckle under and, and get it under control, it uh, it will have consequences far beyond the homeless. Mm -hmm. And it is worth noting that it is unlikely that you're going to get infected by just going to the convention center. It's people who are mostly in contact with at-risk populations who are more likely to be in infected. But um, why don't you talk a little bit about the city's response with the inoculations? Why don't you walk us through how the city is trying to grapple with this ongoing crisis? Yeah, you know, it's actually the county health department that, that's in charge of the inoculation piece. Uh, they started their um, inoculation vaccination event. Uh, I guess, you know, I was just looking at a document that said that their first uh, uh, batches of vaccines went out in late March. Uh, this outbreak was detected on March 3rd. So within a month, they started uh, vaccinating at homeless shelters and other places, uh, you know, like Father Joe's uh, down on Imperial Avenue, where, where a large proportion of the county's homeless population is uh, concentrated. Uh, you know, and then uh, in, uh, in late May, early June, they, they started to think, oh, gosh, you know, the cases are increasing. We need to do more. Uh, so they started these foot teams. Uh, Peter Rowe, one of our reporters, went out with one on Monday and had a really good story in Tuesday's paper. I'd recommend you uh, take a look at that if you'd like to see kind of what the uh, on-the-ground um, uh, foot team uh, vaccination effort has been like. But this is where they take a public health nurse along with uh, law enforcement, uh, local law enforcement, and send them out to wherever it is that they're having trouble uh, getting people to get vaccinated. Uh, you know, and so they've been doing those foot teams for a few few months now. And, uh, you know, the, the latest count, I believe, uh, from Tuesday's press conference with the city, 
was that they're now up to something like 29,000 vaccinations administered. Wow. Uh, I was just looking at their records. Uh, you know, in May, I think they said they had about, no, May, I think that would be June, they had about 4,200 vaccinations. So from June until now, they, you know, they've gone from 4,200 to 29,000. Yeah, so hopefully that uh, stops the spread of this outbreak. But with that long incubation period, it's really hard to say how long that's it's right. Last. It's really interesting. I was uh, talking to some public health uh, folks a few weeks ago, and they were talking about an outbreak that occurred in Hawaii uh, uh, in shellfish that came from, I think, the Philippines. Uh, and they said that in order to get that thing under control, they actually ended up vaccinating 100,000 people. Wow! Uh, just because this uh, this incubation rate is so, you know so long that uh, you know you don't know. Uh, I guess that the issue there is that you actually become contagious two weeks before you show symptoms. So you have that two-week period where people can be spreading this without without even realizing they're infected. So unlike other outbreaks, there isn't quite a single source yet detected for what's happening in San Diego. Could you maybe explain why that's the case? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, a lot of these outbreaks are linked to specific foods. You know, there was a big uh, multi-state outbreak uh, that had 900 cases a few few years back that started in a Chi-Chi's restaurant in Pennsylvania, had to do with... Uh, green onions that were, were inappropriately harvested in New Mexico. And so those green onions went out to different restaurants and they were used to make salsa and, and all kinds of other things. Uh, so, you know, a lot of these outbreaks are linked to specific foods. There were pomegranate seeds, as I said, uh, seafood uh, in Hawaii. Uh, but there is another kind of outbreak. It's always gone on since humans have uh, lived in groups together, and that is the person-to-person -person, uh, spread. And that's what we've got here in San Diego versus the food uh, related spread. So it's, it's not that this is um, uncommon that, you know, this this person to person spread occurs all the time. We, we have in every city uh, a certain number of uh, expected hepatitis A cases every year. Uh, the, the, the difference here is that the, the spread has just um, gotten so much wider than it usually does. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's say we have a listener or something that um, works in East Village or downtown. What would you recommend for someone like that who isn't in direct contact with the at-risk population but is near them? Yeah, you know, that question came up earlier this week at the uh, big joint press conference they had down uh, in front of the county administration building here in, in San Diego. Uh, they say that there's really no, no need to get vaccinated if you simply work downtown in an area where homeless people are present. Uh, it's, it's less likely that it's going to be living on a door handle you're touching or something. Uh, you know, if you, if you are someone who has a job that puts them in more direct contact, you know, like a first responder, like a food handler, uh, you know, that kind of thing, then, then they, uh, they are definitely recommending vaccination, but not so much for just people who just generally work in a general area where, where homeless people might be. We're headed into flu season. This is a time to remember to, uh, you know, wash your hands and tell your kids to wash their hands. This is a good time to uh, make sure that you're, uh, you know, doing that 20 seconds of hand washing. If you don't want to get this th thing or give this thing to somebody else, uh, hand washing is still the key. It's kind of boring advice, but it's, uh, you know, it's just a basic thing that your mom told you to do growing up. And uh, gosh, it's really, <laughs> it's really important. All right. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Thanks. It's rare to have a hepatitis A outbreak that isn't tied to a food source. Data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention attributes foreign travel to 62% of all hep A infections, followed by 33% tied to tainted shellfish. That remaining 22%, physical contact and drug use, are at the core of San Diego's outbreak and is an issue that is worsened by the city's lack of restrooms available to the homeless. But the city can't say they weren't warned. UT Watchdog reporter James DeHaven explains. So starting back in 2005, the uh, civil grand jury, which is formed every year uh, under California state law, just to sort of keep an eye on government and inform them how to do things better, uh, started telling the city they needed to build more restrooms, or at the very least, start cleaning human waste off the streets uh, on account of a growing homeless population and sort of a static growth in bathrooms. That happened uh, actually initially in 2004. They warned about the street cleaning. In 2005, they warned about the restrooms, again in 2010, and then again in 2015 on both counts. Um, so it's, it's something that has been raised multiple times by this uh, grand jury body. The city has installed some new restrooms available for the homeless population, but even though there are restrooms spread around downtown, they are not all open to the homeless, some of which may only be open during the day, 
and some are even so poorly maintained that even the homeless won't use them. There are people who live at Father Joe's villages who have become infected. The number of residents was not available immediately, but leaders of the nonprofit say no volunteers or staff members have contracted hepatitis A. Additionally, the state's ban on single-use plastic bags makes it harder for homeless people to clean up when they can't use a toilet. What this means is human waste is polluting our city. It's spreading beyond San Diego as well. Cases have been identified in East County, and Los Angeles County has also declared a medical emergency. During the past few weeks, the city has ramped up its efforts to keep the virus contained. Streets downtown are being washed down with a bleach solution, and street teams have been vaccinating homeless people. To get a handle on the hepatitis A outbreak, one of our writers, Peter Rowe, went out with some of the homeless outreach teams to see what's going on in the streets. So, uh, Peter, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, so when do you explain uh, what the homeless outreach teams are doing to help fight this outbreak? Yeah, what they do is they have these mobile teams of nurses who go out and vaccinate the homeless, or actually they vaccinate anyone. It wasn't just the homeless who got vaccinated when we were out. There were also folks who were working downtown, folks who were living, you know, in the area and just walking by, just all comers. Anyone who wanted a, a vaccination got one. Mm -hmm. And also, um, with the nature of San Diego's homeless population, they have been somewhat forced to certain areas in the city. Why don't you kind of describe some of the living conditions that you saw when you were out with the HOT? Yeah, I think if you drive through downtown, it's a common experience to just kind of be shocked and, and appalled by what you see on some streets, but only some streets. So this was 16th uh, down by Island, which is where there's a, a high concentration of homeless. And then over on 17th, which is where the Neil Good Day Center is. Neil Good provides some kind of basic services to the homeless, their bathrooms, their places to sit, but it's only open during the day. Uh, and then they're, the homeless go out onto the streets. So right outside Neil Good, there's this whole community of shopping carts and tarps and tents that goes for a full block. Mm -hmm. And also, hepatitis A is spread through the fecal oral route. Oral route. It is unsanitary conditions yeah. that create this. So in the time that we've been in downtown San Diego at the UT, have you noticed situations like that where it's just kind of on the street? Yeah, of course we have. I mean, we park in a parking lot uh, that's a block away from uh, 600B where our offices are. And when we first uh, came here, the, the parking lot was was inhabited by homeless folks who would leave their their calling cards uh, in stairwells and sometimes in the elevators. Um, so I, I talked to one of the homeless women yesterday and she told me the two restrooms that she uses, she uses Neil Good and then she goes over to uh, Father Joe's Village. Uh, but she says when she, when she can't make it uh, to either of those places, then she just goes wherever she can. I mean, basically on the street or in a bush. And so for the homeless people that you spoke to during your reporting, were they aware of the new restrooms that the city was planning on installing to help fight this outbreak? Yeah, I was surprised at how aware the homeless people were of, of a lot of things happening, including the restrooms. Uh, but, you know, some restrooms have been closed as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were the, the big Portland restrooms that were opened up I guess about a year ago, and uh, at least one of them has been shut down since then. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're pretty savvy about keeping track of that, but I was really impressed by how aware they are of the Hep A outbreak and how lethal that can be. Mm -hmm. And also, how receptive were people to getting vaccinated? Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, as soon as the, uh, the outreach team would uh, pull up someplace... Uh, they'd hop out of a van. They would bring these ice chests that had the, the vaccines in them. The vaccines have to be kept at a, a pretty narrow, cold temperature range. Uh, so they keep them in these ice chests. And they had a bunch of other supplies. They had swabs. They had, you know, kind of surgical gloves. Um, but as soon as they 
stepped out, started setting up, people began to line up. And other folks would ask, you know, hey, where do I get the Hep A? And, and they'd say, right here, right here. Um, so there, there wasn't a whole lot of selling going on. It was more, you know, just kind of letting people know that the nurses are here, and, and that brought people coming. Mm-hmm. And you also got your vaccination not too long ago, didn't you? <laughs> I did. <laughs> so so I, I was interviewing all these people about why they were getting uh, the, the vaccine, and, um, and the nurse asked me, I said, well, have you had your shot? And I said, no. And she said, well, you know, we've, we've got enough here if you want one. And, uh, okay, I, I guess it doesn't hurt. Um, and it doesn't. It, it was a very quick procedure. It took maybe all of, I mean, be, between the time I said yes mm-hmm. and the time I buttoned my shirt back up was maybe 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it wasn't very painful. The thing is you have to kind of keep track of when you got that first hep a vaccine because it's a two-parter and the second part is administered six months later so you have to remember to come back yeah and it's also worth noting that hep a does have a long incubation period so it is possible that some people may have it and don't know yet because they don't have any symptoms and also for some people it's completely asymptomatic so it is kind of a gamble in some cases yeah i guess it is i mean yeah the the incubation period can be up to seven weeks um, which, yeah, that's a long time. And they're saying, you know, if in fact you do, uh, you are diagnosed with hep A, it's a real challenge when they say, okay, who have you been in touch with? Who have you been in contact with in the last seven weeks? That's a lot of folks, right? Mm-hmm. Now, the hep A you mentioned is spread by the fecal oral route, which sounds horrible. And it is, but it's not quite what it sounds like. It it means basically maybe you didn't wash your hands well after using the bathroom and then you ate, right? And so you ingested um, mm-hmm. some excrement or, or some you know urine that carried this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it can be microscopic amounts, so right. in many cases right. you don't even yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, it's not like you're going to see a giant thing. Yeah. yeah. And also with the team that you, that you were working with um, earlier this week, what was their kind of thoughts? Were they worried? Were they feeling like they were getting a handle on this outbreak? What was it like? Yeah, you know, they'd been doing it since um, April, uh, and they go out a couple of times a week and often a couple of times during those days. Uh, so they were fairly optimistic, and in fact, they bumped into a lot of homeless folks who say, hey, I already got mine. Um, I was there when one woman came up to the van and she said, I got my first vaccination, but I can't remember when it was. And I don't know if it's still, if it's time, right, for my second vaccination. So they were able to, just using a cell phone, look up. There's a registry of everyone who gets uh, gets, uh, inoculated. They were able to look her up and say, no, it was four months ago, so come back in two months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great that that information is out there. Um, I guess um, based on your reporting, is there anything else that you feel like people need to know about this outbreak? Well, uh, the, there was a press conference yesterday in which the, the county's chief medical officer talked about how this will probably continue to grow, you know, the number of cases and that more lives will be at risk. Um, it's, I think it's easy to think, well, that's not me because one, I'm not homeless, or two, I'm not a, an IV drug user. Um, but actually, the, the populations that are at risk are quite a bit larger than that. They also include first responders because, you know, they don't know. They rush into a building and they're encountering someone, either police or fire or someone who's driving an ambulance. They don't know where these people are coming from, what their hygiene is like. Uh, same thing with with uh, preschool teachers, right? And there's, um, I've been in a lot of preschools, and there's a lot of bodily fluids going around, right? And you're not really sure, you know, all these kids where they're coming from either. Um, and preschool, even even the the kindest, gentlest, smartest, most lovable preschooler uh, 
isn't the greatest when it comes to washing his or her hands. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so that, that's another population, you know, uh, teachers of a certain age. Um, so there are, there are various uh, populations. Oh, restaurant workers too, right? Um, so there's, there's actually a, a fairly sizable group that should be considered at risk and that might want to consider, should consider, uh, getting a vaccination. Well, Peter O, thank you so much. <laughs> Daniel, my pleasure. Assuming you don't have liver disease and have access to health care, hepatitis A isn't a death sentence. There's a simple solution. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Nick Eventides explains. Washing our hands with soap and warm water is so important. Hand sanitizer, for as convenient as it might be sometimes, perhaps, is actually not as effective as good old soap and warm water washing, hopefully for at least 20 seconds. Additionally, if you live or work downtown, consider getting vaccinated. Refocus is a production of the San Diego Union Tribune. This episode was produced by Lauren Flynn and myself, Daniel Wheaton. Special thanks to the reporters who are keeping us up to date on this topic. Paul Sisson, Peter Rowe, Jeff McDonald, James DeHaven, and Joshua Emerson-Smith. Courtesy video was provided by Fox 5 San Diego and by our videographers, Hayne Palmer IV and Howard Lippin. Keep an eye out for Refocus on your podcast feed, and please rate and review us. For Refocus, I'm Daniel Wheaton. See you next week.